Welcome back to Not Your Average Joe, the podcast that'll make anyone a little less average. I'm your host, Joe Franco, coming in live from Antwerp, Belgium, or as I like to call it, Twerp Town. So I've been here for a minute. I'm basically living back and forth between Connecticut and Antwerp. So random, I know. It's a long story. But for the sake of what this means for you is that since coming here, I've been coming here for a year back and forth. I've realized that Dutch and this process of me learning Dutch reminds me a lot of how I started learning English. Why? Because they're similar in nature. They're both Germanic languages. And so a lot of the sounds that you have to make in Dutch, or in my case in Flemish, they remind me of the first time I learned a Germanic language, which was English when I was five years old. And also because the feeling of being completely lost in a conversation, like that brings me back to the first time I learned a language. My partner is Flemish and his friends and family, everybody is Flemish, which is Belgian, Belgians from the north that speak Dutch. So even if I were to learn standard Dutch, I still would get lost in translation here. It's a lot to learn and to not only encourage myself to keep going with Dutch, but to relive the reality of how I first learned language. I wanted to make this episode with a bit of a living memoir piece on how I first learned English. So I have no idea how this will come out. I just know that I could keep writing on and on. This is stuff for the memoir really is, but I hope you enjoy it. And before I get into today's episode, I'm very excited to announce that I finished the $7 for seven days language learning challenge. I'm putting all of the information in the show notes below or in the description box of the video. This challenge is basically like the seven days of motivation that you need, whether you're learning your first language or your fifth. I have covered all the bases, so if you're a beginner, I've given you mild challenges. If you're intermediate or advanced, I give you spicy challenges. I do these challenges for myself because it keeps me motivated, and I also love uniting a massive amount of global language learners because learning a language can get very lonely, as you'll hear in today's episode. But if you want to join the challenge, the challenge is basically open from now until the 24th. If you join before the 24th, you get access to a live masterclass that I'll host with all of the updates on how I've been learning my languages, on how I study. I'll give you bonus prompts to journal in your target languages, and you'll get to experience a little bit of that Joe Club magic with language learning. You get lifetime access and there's a 30 day money back guarantee, but like $7, I purposely made it the same price as an expensive coffee, because if you can buy a double shot mocha latte, you can spend $7 to practice a language that can potentially change your career opportunities, your romantic opportunities, and your life. And that is how we're going to play this game. So again, all of that information is down below in the show notes. And I hope to see you on the 24th or on the challenge. Kill the intro, sis. You know she's not your average show, not your average show. This is the story of how I learned English. I was five years old and my mom asked me a question that changed my life forever. How would you like to go on an adventure? Of course, it was in Portuguese and sounded more like Ta fim de ter uma aventura? Eager beaver I was, I responded, Sim, claro mãe. Yes, of course, mom. Next scene is me, my sister and my grandparents on a plane with my legs barely touching the floor of this massive tin can that sped up so fast I saw clouds out of the window. I had frio na barriga, or cold, in my belly, but the feeling felt more like excitement, less like anxiety. The nerves, however, grew the minute we landed. I remember the cold chilling through my thick jacket grandma picked for me. Se agasalha, Joaninha, tá frio. Vó, my grandma, scolded me if I forgot to zip up or cover my neck. In her grandparents' wisdom, a chill in the neck meant catching the plague. And we had a new life to get to, so I couldn't possibly afford to be sick. So there we were, a bunch of brown-skinned Brazilians landing in JFK, where the fluorescent lights seemed to wash out our vibrance. And that was just the beginning of losing bit by bit of our luminance. We came around April of 1998. Before that day, the only language in my mind, heart, and vocal box was Brazilian Portuguese, Português, Carioca da Gema. I knew of the United States or os Estados Unidos because my mom would bring me back plastic-smelling dolls once a year on her trip. 
The USA was always associated with material possessions as far as I can remember. TV remotes, VCRs, it all smelled and felt artificial, whereas in Rio, I grew up stepping barefoot on natural clay tiles, our clocks made of tin or copper, silverware heavy from real silver, stones, bricks, cement, it was all earth. At first it was all fun and games, but our arrival celebrations died down about a week later. Unlike most immigrants, my mom decided she wanted to raise us far away from the Brazilian community her brother had become embedded in, the brother that invited us to come and stay. Pockets of communities like this exist all around the world in cities big and small alike. In Danbury, Connecticut, there were enough Brazilians that in theory you could live in the US for years and never learn English. They had created Little Brazil, an ocean away from their homeland. As a bold and rebellious 34-year-old mother of three, divorced, my mom was committed to raising us in the thick of the unknown. A small town of Americans who mostly had never left the USA and therefore only spoke English. Let me tell you, what we experienced next created enough empathy, trauma, and resilience that has shaped my character since five years old. Imagine you're thrown inside of a classroom with kids who look nothing like you, sound nothing like you. To make matters worse, you're mistakenly put in a class above your age level. We moved in May when I was five, and they put me in the first grade even though all the other kids were already six and already knew how to read, write, and speak English. I had those same skills as a five-year-old, but in my native language of Portuguese. All of those hours practicing how to read and write in Portuguese were now useless. For survival's sake, my memory from that time is a bit of a blur. I do remember the smell of plastic lunch boxes, crumbs gathering around the zippers. I remember the sound of the plastic around my cosmic brownies, the sting of the artificial juice that came out of squishy plastic tubes. I remember wishing I had money for hot lunch. I remember being embarrassed of the Winnie the Pooh backpack my mom bought because poo sounded like boom, which in Portuguese means fart. I remember crying every day after school because of the exhaustion of another eight hours having to play charades for survival. I'd hold in my pee so I never had to ask for anything. Without the words to request your needs, you train yourself to not need much. I could get by if I just observed what the other kids were doing, mimicking when they cleaned up their papers or when they lined up to go to lunch. I followed physical motions because without verbal language that's the only thing I could understand and reciprocate. Body language and observation was what helped me survive in that time of complete and utter inability to express and understand a language that only seemed more complicated as the days went on. It's like you're suffocating. You're unable to say what you need to say, unable to express yourself fully, a limitation I did not choose but had to deal with. The worst part is that none of us, not even my older brother, older sister, or mom spoke English. So we each had our battles to fight on a daily basis. My siblings in the school for older children and my mom in a mansion with cleaning products in her hand she hoped would not ruin the floors or stain fabrics. She quickly learned the meaning of bleach. At the end of every day, a layer of exhaustion and relief clung in the air. We were safe again and had made it through another day. Eventually, summer break came and I had survived my first grade as a five-year-old, one year premature, with only one incident of peeing my pants because I didn't know how to ask how to go to the bathroom. We spent all summer long trying to learn English as fast as we could. I had books with pictures of body parts, fruits, and places with English words underneath. I remember needing to make an effort. Time was ticking and soon I'd be back on the battlefield. Even as a little version of myself, I wanted to help my situation, and better yet, help my family who struggled just like me. Parenting is hard with a language barrier, because everyone is in survival. But this determination is what eventually excited me about putting myself in all sorts of wild and uncomfortable situations in the years to come. By the next fall, I came in knowing the basics that would at least prevent me from crying and peeing my pants in the middle of the carpet. A linguistic win. The next year, they had also hired an ESL teacher, or English as a Second Language, for a few of us kids who came to class speaking Thai, Spanish, and me, the only Portuguese speaker. The ESL teacher only spoke basic Spanish, so I even learned some Spanish while trying to learn English. And that's where I met my first friend, Crystal R., whose wavy hair and light brown skin felt familiar enough to me where words and the ability to verbally express ourselves didn't really matter. Neither one of us could speak English, but smiles were enough to have a companion for lunch and the playground 
a time I previously dreaded. In ESL, we did tons of worksheets to learn grammar, we played games to speak in a safe space, and it felt like a refuge. And even so, I wanted to graduate ESL sooner than everyone else, because apparently I was, and am, very competitive with myself. Around the same time, our teacher started assigning this terrible activity of picking a book every single day to read and then come back the next day with a paragraph summary of what you had read for homework. At first, I didn't understand the assignment, but I stood in line behind the other kids who reached into a big plastic bin filled with shiny books. I thought we were picking a book to take home for free, so naturally, I reached in for the thickest one. We didn't have money for many things, so freebies were appreciated. The next day, the teacher scolded me for not having done the homework, and with careful observation of my classmates, I finally understood the assignment. From that day on, I only picked the thinnest books, and with the help of a dinky electronic translator, my mom and I cried our way through several pages. A year or so after that, I was a master of not only dealing with extreme frustration, embarrassment, and solitude, but I began to master the language too. My Portuguese started to thicken with Americanisms, and an accent my Brazilian family would tease overcame me, making me want to speak it even less. Before I was 10, I was my mother's translator for all legal things, permission slips, and I took on a parenting role because with English mastery, I had power kids normally would never have. But like they say, with great power comes great responsibility. I understood I was different. My siblings and I worked on the weekends and kept our heads down, but when someone needed translating, I was to be plucked out of class and praised for saving the day. I love that feeling, the feeling of being helpful. I wanted to be what I needed, but didn't have. A superhero converter to make communication seamless between the misunderstood and everyone else. And even though I eventually became more comfortable with English than I am now with Portuguese, that same motivation keeps me learning all sorts of languages. When I learned English, I held power in my hands and opened my opportunities 10x. Then I learned French with the same vision in mind. Even though I wasn't living in France or had no plans to yet, I understood that there were worlds out there inaccessible to me unless I stumbled down the path of painfully learning this new language. Then Italian, then Spanish, then I relearned Portuguese, then I started learning Greek, Arabic, and now Dutch. There is always pain. It's always a struggle, but there's intellectual resistance that appeals to me because I know on the other end is a legitimate superpower. Right now I'm in Belgium stumbling my way through Dutch and it reminds me of that five-year-old brave enough to flail her way to fluency. The good news is that the more languages you learn, the more you understand and expect this pain that comes as a result of the journey. The bad news is, is that actually learning a language really doesn't get any easier. But the best news is that you know you did it once, so you understand fully you can do it again. And when you do, you'll be able to unlock new worlds and help people, including yourself, feel more understood. And that is it for the day. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. It's always crazy going down memory lane with this because you forget, you forget. Like I use English all the time, but in my época when I was only in Portuguese and now Portuguese is rusty and English is dominating. But then it makes me think I'm 31 now, so how many more languages can I squeeze into in one lifetime? And it's exciting. It's really exciting. The embarrassment is real. If you're learning a language and you feel embarrassed or shy, it's real. That happens. It happens to me in every single language, but like that pain and that embarrassment is a bit of a companion because I know that that is the only way to push past that moment of, am I going to learn it? Am I going to learn it? You have to be embarrassed. You have to go through things that are uncomfortable in order to get fluent. So I'm giving you all a big hug. You got this. I hope to see you in the seven day challenge and even maybe in Joe Club Fluent because we're meeting twice a month to practice our language because we all believe that language learning is a superpower. It really freaking is. And it teaches you so much about yourself in the world and culture and food and music and all the good things that keep you smiling, you know? If you want to travel without being able to travel, learn a language, because that's what I did. A big piece of this too was that we were undocumented. So language gave me access to worlds I couldn't actually go to because we were waiting for our papers to come through. And when you're undocumented, you can't leave the country until your paperwork is processed. For us, it took 12 years. 
So in those 12 years, when I wanted to live a global life and couldn't, the only way I could travel was learning French and learning Italian and studying and imagining what life could be. And then eventually when I got to those places, I was able to connect deeper because I had practiced all those years. So cheers to all of us out here going through the struggle of language learning. I can't wait to meet many of you in the masterclass on the 24th or just see you when I see you. I've linked all of the information for the challenge in the show notes if you missed it. As always, you can always follow me on Instagram at Joe underscore Franco and send me DMs of what you thought of this episode. If you relate, are you relearning a language that you kind of ditched when you were younger? Are you learning a new language for survival sake now? Tell me more about your language learning journey in the comments of YouTube, or you can slide in my DMs and let me know there. And I can't wait to keep on having these multilingual chats because I feel like there aren't many places where we can have them. Have an above average week because you deserve it. And I'll see you soon. Hey, yo, come listen to my girl, man. What you doing? Shit.